So the next topic that we have uh, is about gas chromatography. So in this uh, module, these are the following learning objectives. Describe the principles of separations in gas chromatography. Explain the illusion methods and the stationary phases that are used in GC. Identify the basic components of gas chromatograph and their specific functions. And evaluate the applications of GC in analytical samples. Now, to guide you better, okay, I want you to watch okay, the links to the videos uh, shown here so that you can understand the fundamentals of the GC and its columns. Okay, so if we're going to look at the principles of gas chromatography, and this is where a separation of process in microgram quantities by passage of the vaporized sample in a gas stream through a column containing a stationary phase or solid phase. So the components migrate at different rates due to the differences in boiling point, solubility, and absorption. So if you're going to look at the gas chromatography process, okay, this is a sample where it is introduced into a heated injector, carried through a separating uh, column by an inert gas, and detected as a series of peaks on a recorder when components leave the column. If we're going to look at the types of the GC that we have, we distinguish three types of gas chromatography based on the types of stationary phase involved. So in GC, the mobile uh, phase here is a gas. So unlike in LC, okay, the mobile phase usually does not interact with the analyte. So the mobile phase simply carry uh, the analytes alone. And the mobile phase is usually uh, referred to as the carrier gas. So if we're going to look at the three types of gas chromatography, we have the gas liquid, wherein the stationary phase is a liquid adsorbed on the solid surface. So this is the most common type. And then we also have a gas solid, where the stationary phase is a solid material. And then we also have this gas bonded phase where the stationary phase is an organic material bonded okay, to a solid surface. So this is the different types of gas chromatography. Okay? So if we're going to look at this, uh, what we call uh types of gas chromatography we, we can just say that it is uh between two the the gas liquid and the gas uh, we could say solid so the gas liquid is just you, you have a liquid that is absorbed on a solid surface so everything in the column that you have is are really in, in what we call solid phase it's just happened that one of them has liquid absorbed on a solid surface and the other one is just organic material bonded to a solid space. So in the gas liquid, there's a liquid that's deposited on a solid support or wall of a capillary. So usually that's the GLC. Now the GSC, okay, that's uh, uh, you have a solid material all throughout the one that is organic uh, or uh, bonded. Well, the other one is the solid itself is the stationary phase. Now, if we're going to look at the basic components of the GC, okay, so these are what we can see. So you have here a gas cylinders. So this is where the carrier gases are. And these gas cylinders, they have a flow or injector or uh, no, gas cylinders, they have flow or pressure valves telling you how much gas must be utilized. And in this, uh, what we call carrier gas, okay, so this is your mobile phase. You, you can also see here an injector system. So this is where you introduce your sample, okay? And then once you introduce the sample, yeah, the carrier gas will carry it, it will pass through the column, 
So the column is where separation takes place. And as I said before in LC, this is the heart of chromatography. Okay. Now this, uh, what we call column, it is inside an open. If you're going to look at the what we call uh, GC, it is operated based on the premise of temperature. So the temperature regulate okay, uh, the separation. So that's where the open is. And then in that thing, okay, once the uh, sample pass through the column, it goes to the detector. So the detector is the one that will uh, read the materials that you have, okay? So if you're going to look at the detectors, there's the different detectors that we're going to discuss. So the detector, the detector is interfaced with the readout systems that allow the user to see the peak that comes up, okay? And record that the chromatogram that you have. So this is the uh, basic components of the GC. Now, if you're going to look at the uh, operation fundamentals, as I said before, okay, uh, the same thing with the LC, okay, you dissolve the sample or your solute in a solvent. And what happened, the sample and the solvent are vaporized into the head of the column, okay? So the vaporized sample and solute are carried through the column by an inert gas, which is your uh, carrier gas or the mobile phase. And the thing with this one is, remember that the mobile phase does not interact with the compounds of interest, okay? The mobile phase is just what we call the carrier. So as the sample is introduced to the heated injector, it's carried through the separating column by this inert gas, okay? So as, We look at okay, how the carrier gas is being carried in the, the column or how the sample is being carried by the inert gas. The thing that we need to remind is all of the solvent that pass, uh, passes through the column, they're usually unretained, okay? Because the solvent is not your mobile phase. The, the one that is the mobile phase is the uh, carrier gas, okay? Now the separation occurs by the interaction of solute with the stationary phase. And then detection usually occurs by a, right, by, by a variety of methods. It can be thermal conductivity, flame ionization, thermoionic or electron capture detectors. And if we go on, look, uh, look at the operational fundamentals of GC, the separation is based, okay, on the different interactions with the mobile phase and the stationary phase. Now, usually the retention of the solute is determined mostly by its vapor pressure and volatility. So this depends on their so-called boiling point, okay? So the one that is more volatile, they are usually uh, what we call retain less compared to the one that is uh, 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 less volatile. So the one that has a higher vapor pressure, they are retained less, okay? Now the solid retention is also controlled by its interaction with the given stationary phase. Now gas mobile phase, they has much lower density compared to the liquid phase. So there's a decreased chance for interacting with the solute, but there's a more the increased chance that solid or liquid stationary phases or phase interacts with the given solute. So let's look at the uh, carrier gas that we have here. So there are several, we could say carrier gas. And the main purpose of the carrier gas, as I told you earlier, okay, they are the one that carry the sample through the stationary phase. So if we're going to look at some of the common carrier gas, usually it includes 
helium, argon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Okay. As much as possible, <clears throat> oxygen is avoided. You don't want to have oxygen to be in, in what we call on the system because it will oxidize the stationary phase. So if you ask, is oxygen still useful? Yes, but the thing is, it can oxidize your stationary phase. So as much as possible, it says here, must be free of all traces of hydrocarbons, water, and oxygen, okay? Uh, you avoid the oxygen as much as possible, but in some, they use it if they need to use uh, oxygen as the carrier gas. Now, main reason of this is they may deteriorate the polar stationary phase or reduce the sensitivity of the detectors, okay? So each of these carrier gas has very different uh, characteristic, okay? If you're going to look at the Van Dimter uh, equation of each of the carriers got, they, they are usually uh, not the same. So if we're going to look at the carrier, carrier gas or the mobile phase, it does not affect solute retention, but it affects okay, the desired efficiency of the GC system. So if you have the low molecular weight gases like helium and hydrogen, they will give you larger diffusion coefficients. That's why I said the bomb, the bomb dimter uh, equation is really different. And if you have low molecular weight gases, usually they are faster and more efficient in terms of the separations. You also look at them in terms of the stability of columns and so solutes. Hydrogen and, or, and uh, hydrogen or oxygen, it can react with the functional groups of the solutes. Hydrogen is a reducing agent, oxygen is an oxidizing agent. And whatever functional groups you have in solute and the stationary phase, okay, they could interact or react with hydrogen and oxygen. And with the surface of the injector connections and detector. So as much as possible, you want uh, uh, this carrier gas <clears throat> to have some sort of a response to the detector. Now, TCD requires hydrogen or helium. Other detectors require specific carrier gases. Now, if you're going to look at the carrier gas as much as possible, you want it to be 99.9995% pure, okay? Impurities such as water and uh, oxygen, it can chemically attack the liquid phase in the column and destroy it. Water, especially if you have water, it's going to mess up your column. So the way to prevent this from happening you have this inline gas purifier. So if you look at some of the GC system, they contain some sort of traps or filters. And the main function of this is the removal of co common contaminants like the oxygen, moisture, and the hydrocarbons from GC carrier or the detection gas. So that is, uh, we could say, the mobile phase. Now, if we're going to look at the other, the, the next components we have here, the sample injector, okay? So if you're going to look at the sample injector, the purpose of this is to introduce sample as plug at the head of the column. And if you're going to look at this one is, uh, sample injector usually uh, affects the bond broad broadening. So if you have a GC, uh, system, most of their what we call injector are usually warm, okay? Injector typically is 50% hotter than the open. So if you're going to look at the typical sample injection port, so you have it like this one. So this is the syringe needle, the syringe barrel. So there's always a septum 
at the top of the uh, injector. Okay, so when you 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 what we could introduce your uh, sample through the sample injector here, so it will uh, sort of release the thing here. So there's a capillary uh, column that you have there. So once you release here, so there's some uh, compartment that you have here. So once it's released, this one, there's a carrier gas that moves in that you carry the sample that you introduce. So the sample is flush evaporated and it expands into the gas expansion chamber. So this is the gas expansion chamber. And the injection columns, uh, volumes that are usually used are very small. If you have a capillary columns, uh, one microliter is enough. If you have packed columns, it can be from one to 20 microliter. So I would suggest you watch the videos, okay, whose link is shown here, okay, because it's going to explain you more uh, about sample injector. And in addition, for if you're going to look at the capillary columns, there, there are what we call the special injectors that are used, which operates in two modes. Okay, So the two modes that you have here, it can be splitless or split okay so splitless is useful for trace analysis <clears throat> so splitless usually the split flow bent close allowing virtually all the samples to enter the column so in the splitless whatever you you inject it will be all used up Okay, it's used for trace analysis because you contain small amount of the target analyte that you have here. And if you're going to look at this uh, type of column in the split test, okay, everything is injected on it compared to what we call split, which is usually used for concentrate samples. So you, you, you don't want all samples to be injected. So a portion of the sample enters the capillary column with the remaining exiting through the split bend. Okay. So the injection can do the separation from the start. Okay. So as much as possible, you want to make sure that your sample is properly injected in the given uh, GC system. Now, the next thing that we're going to discuss, or before we move on, I want you to look at the video here. It's going to tell you more about this uh, nature of split vest or split type uh, sample injector thing. So the next thing that we're going to do is where separation takes place. So as I have mentioned in LC, uh, chromatographic column, that is the heart of separation. Okay. So in this chromatographic column, we can say that we have several types. Of columns. Okay, the first one that we have is the pack columns. So pack columns is deep, is similar to LC column. Okay, it's used in uh, early gas liquid chromatography. So typically it's made up of glass, teflon, and aluminum. The typical length of this is two to six meter, with the internal diameter of three millimolar. So it's filled with material called the solid support and the material which holds the stationary phase. Okay. Uh, the solid support would have a large surface area, so around 0.5 to 7.51 meters squared per gram. It has a good strength characteristic. It's usually inert with respect to the solute and uniformly wetted. Okay. So you can also have in here some packed materials or particles or cross-linked 
polymer that fills the column. Now the particles may be stationary phase or a high boiling liquid may be deposited on them. Now, if you're going to look at the pack columns that we have, okay, the stationary phase and the support materials are the same. So you can have a diatomaceous earth, which contains the silanol group, the SiOH, and it serves as the active sites for absorbing sites, uh, so absorbing solute in gas so solid chromatography. You can also use alumina, molecular sieves, which are uh, crystalline alu uh, aluminosilicates such as zeolites and clay, silica, and active carbon. Now, the gas uh, solid chromatography includes long column lifetimes, ability to retain and separate some compounds. So this is for geometrical isomers and greenhouse gases, and not easily resolved by other GC methods. So these techniques, however, results in a very strong retention of low volatility or polar solute. Now, the other type of column is the so-called capillary columns or the open tubular columns, okay? So here we could say you have a silica capillary and Capillary columns, they have small internal diameters around roughly 0.1 to 1 millimolar. And the band lengths that they have would be from 10 to 30 meter. Okay. So in your open tubular column, you have solid supports that includes glass beads and fluorocarbon polymers, which have an advantage of being more inert than your diatomaceous earth that you have uh, in your pack column. Okay. And if you look further at the silica column, the silanol group of the support the surface that you have is deactivated by silanization with dimethyl chlorosilane. So if you're going to look at this, so this is your silanol. Okay. So it will be deactivated if you add here the dimethyl chlorosilane. So there's no uh, hydroxyl group that is exposed. You can see that it can, it can be end cup, resulting to minimum adsorption that you have, okay? And if we're going to look at the open tubular column, it's silica capillary. Okay, so the stationary phase is coated on the inside of the column. So it can be wall-coated open tubular column or the WCOT, okay? So the capillary tube is coated with a thin layer of stationary phase. So the newest wall-coated open tubular column are fused silica open tubular columns or the FS, uh, FSOT. Okay, so it has a bare wall of capillary. If, it's, if you have a WCOT, the coating of stationary face on the wall. Okay, you can also have the support coated top open tubular column where the inner surface of the capillary is lined with a thin film, usually around 30 micron of a support material like diatomaceous earth. So if you have SCOT, you have layers of particles bound to wall coated with thin layer. So you have a support coated there. That's why support coated open tubular column. And then you also have the porous, porous layer open tubular, uh, or we call it the plot. So this is a thin layer of porous solid bound to the wall. Now, if you're going to look at the comparison of the properties of your typical GC column, so these slides will tell you, okay, the difference between them. So compare with the pack columns that you have there, 
okay? All these uh, open tubular types of column are longer. So FSOT can go from 10 to 100 meter, okay? Uh, and, other, and the other what we call open tubular column. And then in terms of the inside diameter, all the open tubular columns are smaller compared to the packed column. So this results, okay, the inside diameter and the length to a better efficiency compared to the one that we observed in the packed column. So the one where they overlap in terms of efficiency would be the one with the uh, <clears throat> SCOT, okay? Now, in terms of the uh, sample size, okay? So you can also use a smaller sample size uh, in this open tubular column content compared to the pack column. So if you're going to look at the difference between the three, so this is how they're different. They're different. So uh, the WCOT, so you have here a uh, wall-coated open tubular, and then the PLOT, so you have here some sort of a porous solid that is bound to the wall. And if you have an SCOT, so you have here a layer of particles that is bound to the wall, coated with thin layer. Now, if you're going to look at the structure of the stationary phase, okay? So usually, siloxane, the polydimethyl siloxane, is the common backbone for creating the different stationary phases. And the way you change the property that you have is you replace the metal groups with other uh, functional groups. And usually when you change it with other group, it will change its polarity and it's a uh, separation capability. So this is the general structure that you have. And as you could see here, okay, you have here uh, the R where you can replace it with other functional group to change its polarity and separation uh, capability. You can have a penyl, okay, a cyanopropyl, and trifluoropropyl. So if we're going to look at the common uh, stationary phase that we have here, so depending on the stationary phase that we have, it, it will give you different polarity and it's, it's useful in different uh, application. So you have the common names that is usually used here. So the experience that I have is carbowax, which I usually use for free acids, alcohols, and other polar substance. But each of the stationary phase that they have here, depending on the composition, they have their different common application. So at least if you are asked or given a problem, you, 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 you base the type of the stationary phase that you're going to use on the application or on the sample that you want to determine or analyze. So if your samples are pol polar, then you can use the carbowax. If your samples are just hydrocarbons, so you can use the one that's called choline, okay? So if your sample is, we could say the polyunsaturated fatty acids, like the FAMES that we usually do in human milk, it's the methyl esters, so we use the OB275. So that's, that's the different, uh, we could say, column that you can choose from. Okay, so whenever you select a stationary phase, it can be a non-polar stationary phase like the one that we have here, okay? So the primary mode of this non-polar stationary phase of, uh, we could say it's the interaction due to the Van der Waals force, forces and the analysis of similar boiling point will elude with increasing molar mass. Now, if the analyte has aromatic rings, you, you need to use a stationary phase with aromatic rings, okay? Taking advantage of the uh, pi-pi stacking interaction. If the analyte contains polar 
functional groups of he or heteroatoms, there are many uh, polar stationary phase that are available and the partitioning is really governed by uh, primarily the polarity. Now let's go on the detector. So there are a variety of detectors that we can uh, choose from, depending on the sample uh, that we have. So a variety of detectors exist and the choice depends on the analyte and the sensitivity required. Now, the characteristics of the uh, ideal detector, okay, you want to have a wide range of sensitivity, 10 to the seven, and it should be stable and reproducible. And another, we could say, characteristic is the linear response, so analyte concentration. So the higher the concentration, the higher is the signal. And you want it also to operate in a wide uh, temperature range, to be ambient uh, to, uh, to 400 degrees Celsius. You want short response time to also use. So once you analyze it, you want to see the peak right away. Okay? And you should, it should similar, uh, it should respond similarly, or it should have similar response to also you. Now, as much as possible, you want it to be non-destructive to sample, but some of them are destructive. So when you say non-destructive to sample, you can recover the sample. Now, among the things that we have are the so-called ionization type. So in the ionization type uh, detector, the analyte is converted into ions and the change in conductivity between the two electrodes is related to uh, the so-called analyte concentration. So FID is the most common type of the GC detector. Okay, they, they said it is a universal detector. It's capable of measuring the presence of almost any organic and many inorganic compound. So if you're going to look at this uh, FID, the organic analytes are pyrolyzed in an air uh, hydrogen flame. So the ions are produced in the plasma around the flame. So if you have a, a, a CH there, it's oxidized to give you CHO plus and an electron. If you have a CN there, it's oxidized to give you NO and CO and the electron, okay? So you converted them into ions. Now the positive voltage is applied to the collector. It's negative to the flame body. So the ions uh, migrate to collective producing a current or the signal. So the main disadvantage of this is this is a destructive detector. So what does it mean? If you use this, you cannot recover your sample, okay? So I would suggest you watch the video that you have here, whose link is have here, to understand more about the flame ionization detector. And the way the process go on this uh, flame ionization detector, it measures the production of ions when a solute is burned in a flame. So it got burned. Okay. Now, thermal conductivity detector, on the other hand, uh, the detection principle is the analyte gases have different thermal conductivities than the carrier gases. So if you're going to look at the uh, thermal conductivity uh, detector, it, it, it is the first universal detector developed for GC. Okay. And they call it a cathometer. I hope I can, I can explain it here, cathometer. Oh no, not cato catherometer, so that one. So when we say catherometer, okay, it has something to do with a hot wire detector. So a platinum gold or tungsten wire or thermistor uh, is placed in the exit gas stream or the given column. 
and a cost, constant voltage is applied to heat the wire. So the temperature or resistance of the wire is proportional to the thermal conductivity of the surrounding gas. Okay, so it, it, it is a double detector system. So one detector in the carrier gas and one uh, detector, uh, one uh, detector in the carrier plus the analyte. So it's just like reference and the sample. Okay. So it cancels out the resistance due to the carrier gas giving signal only for the analyte. So if you're going to look at the principle behind the PCD, okay, it measures the back property of the mobile phase leaving the column. It measures the ability to conduct heat away from a hot wire or thermal conductivity. And there's a thermal conductivity changes with the presence of other components in the mobile phase. So usually you have here an electronic circuit known as the Wheatstone, Wheatstone bridge. I'm not sure if you heard the, the, the term before. So the circuit is, consists of an arrangement of four resistors in, with, with a fixed current applied to them. So what happens, the thermal conductivity changes with the presence of the other components in the mobile phase. So I, I told you there's two uh, detector system, one that has the carrier gas and one that has what we call the carrier and the analyte. Of. So if there's the presence of the analyte, so there will be the differences okay, between the two. Okay? And the voltage that you have between the positive and the negative will be zero as long as the resistance Resistances in the deeper arms of the circuit are properly balanced. So what happens as the solute enters, okay, so as the solute enters here, okay, there's a change in the thermal conductivity and the change in the amount of the heat removed from the resistor, okay? So the, uh, this results in change in the uh, temp resistor's temperatures and resistance leading to a change in voltage that is the uh, voltage difference then the, between the positive and the negative points. Now, there are advantages of the PCD. It's applicable to the detection of any compound in GC uh, compared to FID. This is non-destructive. So it's useful for detecting compounds from preparative scale columns. It's also useful in combination with other GC columns since it is non-destructive. So you can uh, add an additional uh, detector if you have TCD. Now the disadvantage of this one, since I told you, uh, the detection is based on the difference between the mobile phase and the mobile phase with the analyte. So if there's some impurities present in the mobile phase, it can be detected. Okay, and the flow rates, the, uh, what we call, it's sensitive to changes in the flow rate. So you want the flow rate to be just the same all throughout the analysis. So if the flow rate become higher or lower, there will be a signal that will come out. Okay, now the limit of detections that you have here is 10 to the negative seven. And it is much higher than the other. GC detector, so we could say it has a high detection limit, okay? Now, the other detector that we could have is the thermoionic or the nitrogen phosphorus detector, we call it the NPD. So this is also known as the alkali flame ionization detector. It's similar to FID, okay? However, it has flame flows around a heated rubidium silicate base. And the heated bit forms a plasma, which is around 600 to 800 degrees Celsius. And since it's called nitrogen phosphorus detector, obviously it's used for detecting nitrogen or phosphorus containing compounds. So it's sensitive to phosphorus and nitrogen. So you can use it for organophosphate pesticides and amine containing uh, or basic drugs. Now in the current, uh, the, the ion current for nitrogen and phosphorus here, it is 10 to the four 
times uh, we could say that of the carbon. So the disadvantage that we have here, just like the FID, it's a destructive detector and it is less sensitive to organic compounds compared to the FID. FID, but it is more sensitive to other hetero uh, compounds such as sulfur, halogen, and arsenic containing uh, molecules. Okay, the limit of detection of NPD is 500 times better than F FID in nitrogen and phosphorus containing compounds. Now, the next one that we have is the ECD. We just let the siren pass by. So if we're going to look at the ECD, this is a radiation-based detector. It is selective to compounds containing electronegative atoms, such as the halogens. Now, how does ECD work is shown here. Okay, it's based on the capture of electrons by electronegative atoms in a given molecule. The column effluent is passed over uh, beta emitters such as nitrogen, uh, uh, nickel 63. And then the carrier gas is ionized, producing a burst of electron with each radioactive decay. Okay, so why you have, what you have here, you have a nitrogen or argon or uh, methane as the carrier gas. And then you have some beta emitter there so producing you an N plus N plus the electron, usually in there. So you have here an ionized carrier gas. Your nitrogen becomes an ionized carrier gas. So the potential is applied between the collector, which is the anode, and the detector body, which is the cathode. And it's going to produce a constant background current. So the current flows decreases in the presence of the analyte molecules as the analyte captures the emitted electrons. Now, if you're going to look at the ECD, as I've told you, it's based on the capture of electrons by electronegative atoms in a given molecule. So typically it's used for environmental testing, the detection of chlorinated pesticides or herbicides polynuclear aromatic carcinogens, or PAH, and the detection of organometallic compounds. It's also selective for the halogen. So maybe all chlorinated and brominated stuff, ECD is the one being used. And it's also selective for nitro or sulfur containing compounds. So the next one that we have is the photo ionization detector. So the photo ionization detector, it uses UV light to ionize the component exiting the column. So the ions are collected by electrodes and the current generated measures the concentration. You use this to analyze wide range of aromatic hydrocarbons. A okay? typical application for this uh, has something to do with the uh, analysis of hydrocarbon pollution of water. So if you're going to look at the uh, photo ionization detector, the effluents here in, in the carrier gas are ionized by an intensive UV light source. And unlike the FID, okay, this is a non-destructive detector. Now, there are other, we could say, GC detectors. One of them we're going to discuss when we go to the mass spec, mass spectrometer, or the so-called GCMS hyphenated uh, system, okay? Uh, we can also uh, include the other detectors here, like the sulfur chemical nonsense uh, detector, the flame photometric detector, the atomic emission detector, and the Fourier transform infrared thing, which is used for the po polar molecules. Now, in terms of the specialized uh, technique used in chromatography, we can use the 
isocratic and gradient version that they have here. So one thing that we can look here is the so-called temperature programming. Okay, so the way that we do here is the open temperature must be controlled to within uh, 0 0.5 degrees Celsius from the room temperature to 400 degrees Celsius. So the open temperature here is progressively raised during a chromatographic run. So usually you start with a lower temperature and then you program it as it increases during the run. Okay. So to improve the resolution of the mixture where the components have a wide range of boiling points and to shorten the overall analysis time by speeding up the illusion of the higher boiling points. So typically what you have here in the temperature programming, you can use constant temperature like the one that you see here. Okay, so low isothermal temperature, so your temperature is constant. If you make it high, so you can see here the separation is not really good. So what you do is you program it, okay? Wherein you run the temperature throughout the separation process. And this provides a basis for the separation of the sample components based on the boiling point. And the way that we look at is the more volatile uh, compounds elute very close together under isothermal condition, but if you're going to ramp the temperature from let's say 50 degrees Celsius to 250 degrees Celsius at a certain uh, temperature changes per minute, it separates out those volatile compounds, okay? Now, note that the temperature programming does not change the order of the elution. So if you have here one, two, three, four, five, six, or compound one, two, three, four, five, six, you will also have the same compound one, two, three, four, five, six in the given order. You can also use pyrolysis, okay, uh, as a good technique uh, used in GC. You can also use derivatization of non-volatile polar. So usually if you have a GC, the main uh, characteristic of your sample that is being analyzed is it being volatile. But what if it's not uh, what we call volatile? So the way that you do is you derivatize your GC, your, your non-volatile sample, okay, uh, prior to chromatography. So I think when you do your orgo, you did some derivatization here. So GC is more popular before in LC. And one aspect that they do, if the sample is, is not volatile, is they derivatize this. You can also do thermal desorption. This is a technique that involves the pre-concentration of substance prior to chromatography. Other stuff that they do, headspace analysis. So headspace analysis, they try to capture the volatile component. I think uh, HPH is the one doing that before, during the time when I was a student and a faculty there in the IC. So headspace analysis involves the examinations of the vapors derived from a sample by warming in a pressurized, partially filled and sealed container. So definitely it will, you will have some uh, stuff to work on this part. And if you're going to look at the uh, application, you can use this for qualitative analysis, wherein you just use this to identify if a certain compound or co uh, a chemical is present. And the way that you look at is by comparison with retention time comparison of retention time. So the retention times of the component of a sample can be compared directly with those of known materials and synthetic mixtures. In cases where a mixture has a large number of components or pure standards are not available, published retention time must be consulted. So remember this formula, the adjusted retention time, okay? The retention time over void volume. Okay. Now, 
you can also use the so-called cobots retention image uh, index it's a it's a means for normalizing retention times by comparing a solute's retention time be, with those of normal alkanes so for normal alkanes it's 100 times the number of carbon so if you're going to look at the compounds retention index i compound is just equals to 100 times the log retention time of the compound okay uh minus the log retention time of your what we call number of carbons of your smaller alkane okay so log uh, retention time here x plus one so this is the larger alkane minus the log retention time or adjusted retention time with the uh, smaller alkane plus the ix You can also look at the compounds retention index, that's I compound. So in the separation, let's say here, that we're going to discuss uh, in our synchronous meeting, okay? You can use quantitative analysis. GC can also be used in quantitative analysis. And the way that we look at this is maybe based on the peak area or the peak height. So the idea here is the higher the concentration, the higher is the peak area and the peak height. Both of them are usually obtained during run. Okay, uh, they say that in the peak height, linear uh, range is less, and it's more sensitive to the changes in the operating procedures. And another way that we can use this uh, GC for quantitative analysis is using the so-called area normalization. So if the components of a mixture are similar in chemical composition and if all are detected, the percentage of weight of each is given by uh, the area of the component X over the total component, uh, total area for all the components times 100. And then you can also use external standard method, standard, standard addition method, and the internal standard method, which we have discussed before. So as I have told you, there are what we call stuff that you need to do here. So all the questions that we have with regards to the calculation, we're going to discuss it during synchronous meeting. So these are the resources that you can read on, on the GC.